Well, here we are. I have an update on the DNA contamination and COVID vaccines nonsense. The update is it's still nonsense. Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and I previously made several videos on this channel talking about this supposed problem of too much DNA in COVID vaccines. And uh, there's still more stuff that people are sending me messages about, so I guess I'd make an update video. In case you didn't know, mRNA comes from DNA, so COVID mRNA vaccines have to have DNA as part of their manufacturing step. Once the DNA is used to make mRNA, it's chopped up and mostly cleared from the drug substance before it's made into drug product. And there are many regulations and testing and quality control steps that go into this whole process because it happens for every biologic, and it's a big deal in terms of regulating in a good manufacturing production environment. And it's not just the FDA, but it's health authorities from all over the world who evaluate the data that pharmaceutical companies send to them, showing that the quality control and purity testing has been done, and they'll even do testing themselves sometimes in order to corroborate the results that are sent to them by pharma companies. But boy howdy, when this guy received some mystery vials in the mail from an anonymous sender that weren't shipped on cold packs and tried to test them for DNA, he thought he was onto something. I make sure to mention the fact that they were thawed and not sent on ice packs because mRNA is relatively unstable and will degrade at higher temperatures, including room temperature, whereas DNA does not. And this guy, in part of his results reporting, tried to use a ratio of mRNA to DNA in order to say there's too much DNA. But if you're using an mRNA to DNA ratio and most of your mRNA is degraded, of course, the DNA is going to look a lot higher than it is. But that was just the start of his problems because the PCR that he did would have failed criteria according to pharmaceutical standards. And if he can't meet pharmaceutical standards when doing this testing, then what are we doing? I explained it all in my first video about this, but in brief, it failed for PCR efficiency, which means that the doubling time of the standards used in the PCR reaction wasn't doubling the DNA properly every time which means that he has an artificially high readout of how much DNA is in the samples since his standard curve wasn't doubling properly. But whatever, he slapped that slop into a blog post, posted it, and hasn't sent it for peer review since, so whatever. Then that was followed by this guy, PJ, or Bucky as I call him. He's PJ Buckholtz. He's a professor in North Carolina. He went in front of a North Carolina legislator in a lab coat for some reason to talk about results that he had not published, and he didn't really know the implications of them. What were those results? He found DNA in COVID vaccines. That was pretty much it. That's all he was saying at the time. He said that he did not find DNA that was above the limit of what is set by health regulators, but he found DNA and he was very concerned that residual DNA at trace amounts was in biologics. It's, it's normal in case you missed that. It's normal for residual DNA to be in biologic drugs at really low trace amounts. Fast forward to later, PJ now thinks he has data showing that there was too much DNA in COVID vaccines, but he hasn't published anything about it, so we don't really have anything to analyze. But at the same time, there were others who were publishing stuff about this topic, mostly in a blog post format, where they claim to have found too much DNA in the COVID vaccines using a method called qubit analysis. All of the genomics experts just laughed. Uh, so qubit is a tiny little fluorometer, basically. It's a little instrument that measures fluorescence, and it comes with a kit that lets you add stuff to your samples so that it fluoresces the DNA and then it reads the fluorescence on the qubit machine. Uh, the short is that this instrument is not suitable for determining the amounts of residual DNA in biologics. It's usually used for genomics experts to determine about how much DNA they have before they go and sequence it, because you need a certain amount of DNA if you want to get good sequencing data. And this instrument basically just is used to say, hey, we have enough DNA, or no, we don't have enough DNA. It's not used in any methods that are qualified and validated to quantify DNA in biologic materials for good manufacturing purposes. It's just not used that way because it's not very accurate, as we can demonstrate. You see, depending on the biologic, the formulation can be quite different. And these different formulations can influence the way a qubit will read the DNA. Not every material is compatible with the way qubit works. 
And it's not just me who can demonstrate this. Here's a video demonstration of how inaccurate a qubit can be from a fellow YouTuber, Conspiracy Cats. This is a video on his channel where a scientist sent him a demonstration of how inaccurate a qubit could be, measuring the same amount of DNA just diluted in different buffers. As you can see, as the measurements go by, it's all the same amount of DNA, but it can vary wildly depending on what it's diluted in. So qubit analysis is not a valid way to measure DNA in this way, but you would actually have to go through the process of qualifying and validating your method, which means that you have to demonstrate that it shows what you say it shows. I've tried explaining this to the uh, guys who say there's too much DNA in the COVID vaccines, but they call it, quote, um, what'd they say? Uh, regulatory gobbledygook. That's what they call it. You know, uh, high levels of experimental rigor um, yeah, they just say, nah, we don't need that. So in short, no validated method published in peer review literature has demonstrated that there's too much DNA in COVID vaccines. Typically, the way people measure residual DNA in biologics is by a method called qPCR or quantitative PCR. The quantitative is because it's used for quantitating DNA. But one of the main complaints that these too much DNA in vaccines guys have had is that qPCR cheats by only measuring part of the residual DNA. And this is how PCR works. PCR uses two primers and one probe to target a small section of target DNA that is very specific to those sets of primer and probe. And it's only amplifying that one specific section. But people don't just take that one specific section of amplification and use only that to calculate how much DNA they have in a situation like this. No, there are uh, multiple ways to do it. Uh, I've explained some before, but you know, I was curious what health regulators actually did in order to measure these amounts of DNA, like they say they have done. And so far, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, or TGA in Australia, they're basically the FDA of Australia, has been really great about addressing the misinformation that these too much DNA and COVID vaccines guys have been putting out. So I emailed them and I asked them just how do they calculate how much DNA is in their COVID vaccine samples? Because like I said, there are a few ways to do it. I just wanted to know which way did they do? And it turns out they picked the way that most overestimates the amount of DNA that could possibly be in that vial. Basically the way they did it is for each copy of that little fragment of DNA that the PCR is amplifying, they assumed that each copy corresponds to a full length plasmid, which is the circular piece of DNA used in the manufacturing step of mRNA vaccines. We know that's not a totally accurate way to estimate the amount of DNA in these vials because, again, the plasmid gets chopped up into small pieces and a lot of those pieces get cleared out. So each copy isn't necessarily corresponding to full-length plasmid being present in the vial. But that's what they did, and they still tested zero batches that exceeded the limit of residual DNA. So again, they were very helpful in confirming that uh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. They did not cheat in measuring the amount of DNA in these vaccines. In fact, they were pretty generous in the way they calculated it, and it still doesn't work out for anti-vaxxers. And these experiments were done using validated, qualified methods that went through an entire process of confirming that they can accurately show what they say they show. So really what we're left with is, do we believe international teams of regulators doing and reviewing the highest quality science that needs to be triple checked, quality controlled, and reviewed at multiple different stages by multiple different people? Or do we believe claims from people who perform work that is questionable or downright sloppy and refuse to publish their work for peer review? So yeah, that's pretty much it. I, you know, I've had people send me some paper that was published in a journal of high school science that uh, didn't properly quantify DNA. Again, they used qubit and nothing else in their paper really showed anything surprising. Uh, and it's the journal of high school science. So what are we doing? There's just no new data to show that the anti-vaxxers have any grounds in this topic. And unless data saying otherwise coming from qualified validated methods is published in a peer-reviewed journal, then that's not going to change. So yeah, that's about it for this topic. Uh, be sure to go check out my previous videos where I cover how residual DNA is not actually that dangerous, and especially if it doesn't include oncogenes, which plasma DNA and COVID vaccines doesn't. Uh, if you want to learn about that, uh, go check out those videos. All right, I'm going to go cut my hair. Don't worry, it'll, it'll grow back. You'll see the afro again. 
See you in the next video.